Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the 33rd QChem webinar. Uh, I am Dr. Adrian Morrison. I'm a research scientist here at QChem. Um, today, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Simon McKenzie at the Australian National University. who will be giving a talk on effective core potential ECP integrals. Simon completed his undergraduate degree jointly between the Australian National University and the National University of Singapore. For his honors year, he worked with Professor Peter Gill, developing methods for the efficient computation of these ECP integrals. He continued this work as an intern at QCAM here in, in California, where he worked with Dr. Evgeny Epitnovsky, uh, implementing these ECP integrals in our next-gen Litsuin integral library. Currently, Simon is a second year PhD student. He's working with Professor Peter Gill, and he's supported by a Westpac Future Leaders Scholarship. Uh, right now I'm gonna turn this over to our speaker. All right, Simon, uh, it's all yours. Excellent, thank you very much for the generous introduction, Adrian. Um, and hi everyone to, uh, hi to everyone who's listening. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm a little bit sick at the moment, so you have to forgive me if I splutter my way through part of this talk. Um, so as Adrian mentioned, uh, I'm going to be talking about some of the new effective core potential capabilities um, uh, as of QChem 5. And this is work that I did during my honours research, so it's a, it's a couple of years back, and work that was implemented into um, LibQuint from 5.0, uh, QChem 5.0 and onwards. So uh, I'm going to start at the very, very basics, but then accelerate pretty quickly to uh, talk about some of the technicalities of uh, evaluating effective core potential or ECP integrals. So uh, start at the uh, very beginning, where all good things start with the, the time-independent Schrodinger equation. And as uh, we all know, we have our Hamiltonian, which is broken up into a kinetic energy operator and a potential energy operator operates onto the wave function to return the electronic energy as an eigenvalue. So we have this unknown, which is our electronic wave function. So the standard approach is we approximate this uh, wave function by a combination of molecular orbitals. And then we approximate these molecular orbitals by a linear combination of basis functions, which is the linear combination of atomic orbitals approximation. Uh, so, for instance, you can uh, view, um, say, different P basis functions, the Px, and Py, and Pz basis function shown here on the right. And it's important maybe at this point to introduce a bit of terminology. So a shell is a set of basis functions with the same exponent, center, and total angular momentum. So the three basis functions I just showed you there, the Px, Py, and Pz basis function would be a P shell. Uh, then we uh, invoke the variational theorem, and that gives us the best wave function possible within our um, approximated wave function by minimizing it with respect to its energy. And Hartree-Fock is the traditional simplest variational method. All right, so this is all nice, but uh, we face significant challenges when applying some of these ab initio methods, applying Hartree-Fock even to heavy elements. We might be interested in heavy elements because there's lots of um, interesting potential drug candidates, materials beyond simply carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. The foremost challenge when we start moving to heavier elements is the increasing number of electrons. So Hartree-Fock um, even formula scales is roughly um, the number of electrons to the fourth. Um, and that means that if you want to do an atom platinum calculation, it would be roughly 60 times more expensive than the atomic nickel calculation. Furthermore, we start to see the introduction of significant relativistic effects as we move down the periodic table. Uh, this is because the core electrons start approaching the speed of light. And um, one of the consequences of this is that the core electrons will gain effective mass in accordance with special relativity. Core orbitals will then contract and this can increase the shielding of the valence electrons, which then have a knock-on effect upon many chemical phenomena. Some interesting examples um, are that the homo-luma gap, 
um, for gold is actually reduced from 4.8 electron volts to 2.4 electron volts um, due to relativity. And that's actually what results in its yellow color. If it wasn't for relativity, um, gold would simply be silver and potentially a large part of the world economy would collapse. Second, um, the, your lead acid car battery um, actually derives 80% of its voltage from relativistic effects, um, according to computational um, calculations. Uh, for instance, you don't see a tin acid car battery, you see a lead acid car battery, and that's because of the relativistic effects. And it's interesting actually, just very quickly to note that um, uh, you can't test uh, the effect of relativity um, experimentally because we only have one world and that's the relativistic world and so it's I think quite interesting to note the role that computational simulations can play in being able to demonstrate how some chemical phenomena can change with relativity because in a computational calculation we can simply turn relativity on and off. Right so effective core potentials or ECPs as I'm going to refer to them uh, for the rest of the talk, uh, one of the biggest ways that we um, get around these challenges of applying ab initio methods to heavy elements. Um, the key is, whereas these, um, whereas these operators previously um, operated over all electrons, now they only operate over the valence electrons. So effective core potentials are really based on the frozen core assumption that only valence electrons are chemically active. And so we can remove spectator core electrons from the calculation and replace them with a simple potential representing them. This is great as it decreases the number of electrons um, because only the valence electrons are explicitly treated and they're typically far, far less than the total number of electrons in the system. And also we can uh, do something which is rather interesting, which is we can derive our effective core potentials to include the vast majority of scalar relativistic effects. And so we can include uh, relativistic effects within the ECP parameterization. Uh, this is quite interesting in a way when you think about it because we're not suddenly solving the Dirac equation when we use um, effective core potentials. We're still solving a non-relativistic um, uh, Schrodinger equation, but we can sort of get relativistic effects um, snuck in there by parameterizing our effective core potential. This, uh, the introduction of effective core potentials introduces this new ECP operator, U, and it also operates over only the valence electrons, NB. So the introduction of this ECP operator leads to two new types of ECP integral types. Uh, sorry, um, uh, that must be calculated for a quantum chemical calculation. Uh, the first type is the unprojected integral. Uh, to demonstrate that, I've, I've plotted, I guess, what I call gold hydride system. And you can really think of this unprojected integral as simply the overlap between um, at, say an S basis function on this hydrogen atom here, an S basis function on this hydrogen atom here, and then another S Gaussian on your ECP sensor. So it's, it's really a very simple integral and uh, um, yeah, it's a very easy integral to calculate. The far more complicated integral is what is referred to as the projected integral. Now, um, with the projected integral, we've introduced this uh, angular projector of angular momentum uh, L. So what I've uh, plotted here is sort of the P projector. And what this P projector does is it projects out sort of the P character of this S basis function centered here and the P character of this S basis function centered here and takes the overlap of those two objects. Now, one can imagine that as the projector angular momentum increases, these projected integrals become more and more complicated. So as we move to say D, F, and even G projectors. Uh, the notation that I'm gonna use for the remainder of the talk is this uh, sort of bastardized bracket notation, where A refers to the angular momentum of my basis function here, B refers to the angular momentum of my basis function here, and L refers to the projector 
and the projector angle and momentum. So this, for instance, would be an SSP projected integral with the following notation. Right, to be a little bit more precise, um, we can assume without loss of generality that the ECP operator is centered at the origin and is of the following form. So these uh, capital U's here are simply radial potentials and they're fitted to a sum of Gaussians times by radial powers. Now these radial powers are usually um, either r to the negative 2, r to the negative 1 or r to the 0. And I just want to emphasize that this is a really, this radial power is really crucial for the approach that is taken in QChem currently. So the first part of this ECP operator is what results in our unprojected integral and is really simple. The second part, as you can probably see, is far more complicated. It introduces these angular projectors, um, uh, spherical harmonics here. And this is the associated projected integral um, written slightly more um, precisely. And yeah, the complication is that uh, you perform this angular integration over your basis functions, basically picking out again the in the p case the p character of your basis function a. Right, so let's just talk about how expensive these difficult projected integrals can be. So the bottleneck of a Hartree Fock calculation is the calculation of the um, number of electrons to the fourth Coulomb integrals. And the big upside of effective core potentials is that we only have to calculate um, the number of valence electrons to the fourth Coulomb integrals. That's really good. So it drastically reduces the number of uh, Coulomb integrals that we have to compute. But the downside is that we must now calculate a smaller number of really difficult projected integrals. So a cubic number of them, the number of ECP centers times the number of valence electrons squared. So you can ask actually how do um, these two computation times stack? Um, and if you do a, for instance, gold six cluster in QChem with a LANL 2DZ ECP, you can find that the total calculation time for this cubic number of ECP projected integrals takes about 1.85 seconds whereas the computation time for this quartic number of Coulomb integrals only takes 0.834 time, uh, seconds. So you can see that even though there is a smaller number of ECP projected integrals, um, they are very expensive. And so systems do exist such that the ECP integral evaluation can contribute significantly to the overall calculation time. Should also emphasize that if you're doing as QCAM does, uh, Coulomb integrals in the correct way, there should only be a quadratic number of significant Coulomb integrals. If you do effective core potential integrals naively as many codes do, and you just compute the full number of cubic ECP integrals, then also as you increase your system size, you're going to find that your calculation time is dominated more and more by the computation of your ECP integrals. So all of this provides a really good motive to improving the efficiency of calculating ECP integrals. Previous authors have looked at this problem um, and going in reverse chronological order to sort of demonstrate that I think the literature has been heading in slightly the wrong direction. Um, we start with Flores et al in 2006 and they proposed a complete or partial evaluation by quadrature. But this can be unpredictably computationally expensive and inaccurate, so not very happy with that. Bodhi et al in 1999 expanded the projected integral and evaluated its components via recurrence relations, but there were a huge number of these components required for a single projected integral. So these recurrence relations were really of limited use. Now finally, going back all the way to 1977, Bartlett et al built the projected integrals by a direct application of the Boys recurrence relation. The problem with this was the expressions that he got were extremely complicated and computationally expensive for the projected integral. 
but in the appendix, um, there's a really beautiful, simple solution for the fundamental projected integral, the momentumless projected integral, for the case where the radial power is um, zero. So that when that ECP radial potential only has R to the zero factors. And this is the expression here. So um, what do these, some of these terms mean? Um, I is a modified spherical bezel function and P is a um, Legendre polynomial. So all pretty simple functions. And this is really the, the gem um, on which our new ECP integral method is founded. So that's all well and good. We have a nice simple expression for the momentumless fundamental integral, but uh, we often want to do calculations with uh, basis functions with angular momentum higher than s. So how do we build uh, projected integrals of higher angular momentum? Well, we usually do that by recurrence relations and they were first introduced by Boys, who's really the, the father of um, the use of uh, Gaussian basis functions to model molecular orbitals. And he pointed out that an integral of arbitrary angular momentum um, for well, each integral of arbitrary angular momentum can um, be obtained by repetitively differentiating the fundamental integral with respect to the nuclear coordinates. So an example here shown is to build the px px s projected integral, we can differentiate with respect to the nuclear coordinate b and bx and ax. The idea here is that we start with fundamental objects, which are uh, differentiated momentumless integrals, and then combine them up to build angular momentum till we reach our desired integral, in this case, the px, px, s projected integral. The problem with this is that we're never calculating just single integrals in a quantum chemical calculation. We're always calculating classes of integrals, where a class is basically the set of integrals associated with constituent shells. So a PP class would be, for instance, the set of integrals, the PX, PX integral, the PX, PY integral, and so on and so forth. So that would look like the class, the PP S projected class would be these um, elements. And um, basically the boys recurrence relation is very inefficient because it fails to exploit the shared intermediates for a given class. These uh, circles of common color represent common intermediates that are repetitively calculated when really they should only be calculated uh, once. And so Bar and Saika in the late 80s, I think, um, came along with recurrence relation which explicitly expressed an integral of arbitrary angular momentum in terms of shared intermediates. And the way they did this was in, uh, by expressing the shared intermediates as auxiliary integrals, where we've now introduced this auxiliary index M, um, which when equal to zero is the true integral, and when M is greater than zero is the successively differentiated integral. And so the idea is the same. We start from um, fundamental objects, which are our um, fundamental auxiliary integrals here, and then we combine them in various ways as shown through um, these, this, this web um, to build angular momentum until we reach our final desired class of integrals. And yet yeah, we're uh, highlighting that presently highly efficient schemes to calculate Coulomb integrals rely on a bar of recurrence relations. So following Arx's method, um, the first thing we tried with this ECP integral method was to derive Bayer and Saika like recurrence relations to the SPD and F projected integrals. And uh, what that means is basically writing the in, uh, projected integral in the following form, um, where I've now introduced this M operator, which is basically an angular momentum amazing operator, which when acting on the fundamental integral um, produces the required angular momentum. The challenge in deriving uh, the recurrence relations as it turns out, 
is commuting this angular momentum raising operator with the derivative of the fundamental integral. In particular, commuting the angular momentum raising operator with terms which are um, either linear, quadratic, uh, cubic, or quartic in the nuclear coordinates. So linear is not really a problem when you commute this um, angular momentum raising operator with just a linear term, you get two terms in the recurrent solution, which is manageable. When you commute the angular momentum, the angular momentum raising operator with a term that's quadratic, you get seven terms. So that's um, getting more expensive in terms of the recurrent solution. And this quickly escalates as you move to higher and higher order uh, nuclear coordinate terms. So um, heaven knows what a cubic term would lead to and heaven knows what a quartic term would lead to. And the problem here is that as you move from S, P, D, F and to higher projected integrals, you get higher and higher order uh, terms that you need to commute your angular momentum raising operator with. And this means that the uh, associated recurrence relations become more and more expensive. What this looks like um, precisely is that in the um, in the recurrence relations here, say for the S projected integral, where I'm building angular momentum on my center A, you get uh, this basically, you get a quadratic term in terms of the nuclear coordinates. And this leads to a novel coupling between basis function angular momentum direction. And so you can see to build angular momentum in the i-th direction, it relies on terms which are decremented in the x, y, and z direction. So couples angular momentum direction. And yeah, likewise, um, this is a sort of recurrence tree demonstration of that. Um, you can see that to build the dx, y, p, z, s projected integral by incrementing the angular momentum in the z direction, it relies on integrals decremented in the x and y directions, the um, p, y, s, and p, a, uh, p, x, s projected integral. So yeah, this coupling really leads to long recurrence relations, which can be quite expensive for significant uh, basis function angular momentum. And uh, from my point of view, uh, leads to very difficult to implement recurrence relations. So this and the difficulty in extending to higher projector angular momentum I really prompted an alternative approach um, uh, for our ECP integral method. And the way of getting around this was introducing additional auxiliary indices. So previously we only had the one auxiliary index M and now we've introduced an additional two auxiliary indices. This allows you to remove the uh, higher order um, nuclear coordinate coefficients. So you no longer get quadratic or cubic or quartic terms, you only get linear terms. Um, and yeah, as you can see, um, hopefully in the following recurrent solution tree, this avoids the coupling of basis function angular momentum direction and um, results in cheaper recurrence relations in general. It also allows you to derive um, what is really nice, a general projected integral recurrence relation. So by general, I mean a recurrence relation that can be applicable to any projector angular momentum type. So for an S projector, as well as a G projector. And um, that's the recurrence relation here. It is six plus two L terms long, where L is the projector angular momentum. And um, yeah, you can see that the coupling hopefully between uh, angular momentum directions is now removed. All right, so recurrence relations allow the efficient calculation of projected integrals, but the number we need to formally calculate still scales cubically as the number of ECP centers times the number of basis functions squared. Let's just consider for a moment a linear organometallic system. So this is sort of what I plotted here, where we've got a ECP center on this, um, I think it's a palladium atom here, and then this long um, carbon chain. 
Now, formally, there's a cubic number of ECP integrals that we have to calculate here, but the ECP operators are really short range operators. So there will only occur significant projected integrals when both shells are local to the ECP center. So both shells on our carbon atoms are local to our ECP center on the palladium atom. And hence of the total cubic number of projected integrals, only a linear number are significant as the system size grows spatially. As significant, I just mean greater than a certain threshold, which can be tuned depending on the precision that you uh, desire for your calculation. So the question is, how do we move from this cubic number of uh, total ECP integrals to our ideal linear number of significant ECP integrals? So what is usually done in all kinds of integral calculations is we use shell pair screening. And the idea here is we do not calculate projected integrals for shells which are far apart. And that leads to a quadratic number of ECP integrals. So what that would mean is that you don't compute any ECP integrals for uh, situations like this, where one shell is on one end of your carbon chain and the other shell is on the other. The shell is too well separated, so the integral is going to be insignificant. Problem is that doesn't completely capture um, the linear number of ideal um, significant ECP integrals because of situations like this, where say you have two shells which are close to one another but far apart from the ECP center. This will be an insignificant ECP integral, but according to shell pair screening, we should calculate it. So what we really need is rigorous projected integral upper bounds um, that should be ideally strong. So as close to the true ECP integral as possible, but also simple, um, so relatively computationally cheap with respect to evaluating the ECP integral itself. And yes, these ECP upper bounds should be able to identify the situations where we get ECP significant integrals. And yeah, once again, the efficient calculation of Coulomb integrals rely uh, both on shell pair screening and um, rigorous upper bounds. And so really what we're trying to do with this whole ECP integral method is to use technology that's been developed for the much more common case of uh, Coulomb integrals to efficiently evaluate um, ECP integrals. Despite its significant potential for efficiency, there's actually been really little work done on deriving projected integral upper bounds. So Song et al. Um, have pretty much the only projected integral upper bound, but in their work, they did not demonstrate the ideal linear scaling. In the method that we came up with, uh, we derived uh, projected upper bound, projected integral upper bounds using uh, a relatively recent concept, which is this idea of a shell bounding Gaussian. Shell bounding Gaussian is an S-type Gaussian orbital that bounds a P, D or F shell as tightly as possible. And so you can sort of uh, visualize it in this way here, where you've got a P shell that's bound by a spherical S shell, um, a D, F or G. And yeah, the shell bounded Gaussians um, uh, give you strong projected integral upper bounds, but also because they're simply S-type Gaussian orbitals, we can use our previous gem, which is our simple expression for the fundamental projected integral, which will give us simple um, uh, ECP integral upper bounds. Uh, for a little bit more detail, a shell-bound Gaussian is really just a S-type Gaussian with a modified exponent. So um, it's given here um, with this exponent that's been uh, modified by this factor sigma a and uh, this factor is really just optimized depending on the particular nature of the integral that you're calculating. So it will emphasize different parts of your original p function say here depending on which parts are needed for the particular operator. Um, you can also create sort of a hierarchy and this is what's done here of upper bound. So in the same way that we have shell pair and shell quartet uh, upper bounds for evaluating Coulomb integrals, 
we can have an ECP shell pair bound, which then uh, which takes the quadratic number of ECP shell pairs and trims them down to a list of linear significant ECP shell pairs, and then that can be fed into an ECP shell shell triple bound, which takes the um, cubic number of total ECP shell shell triplets and trims them down to a linear number of significant ECP shell shell triplets. So to demonstrate the power of uh, the upper bounds, uh, what we've done here is that we've looked at a slab of platinum, have, platinum atoms, so um, basically two atoms thick and then extending in two dimensions. And we placed a Stuttgart relativistic small core ECP on every platinum atom. And because the number of ECP centers scales linearly as we increase the size, we would express expect the uh, number of significant true integrals to reach a linear number, which you can see it doing by about um, uh, 256 platinum atoms in your slab. What you can also see is that the ECP shell shell screening and ECP shell screening, which are based on our rigorous upper bounds, are very strong. So they reach um, the ideal linear scaling by about the same uh, point. And uh, if we use shell pair screening, we achieve an incorrect quadratic scaling. And if you do no screening, then you achieve um, your full cubic scaling. So all of uh, this, um, the efficient recurrence relations and upper bounds screening uh, was implemented into libqint um, as of uh, QCAM 5.0. And um, you can see some representative timings here. So again, this is looking at platinum slab. This time we've put an SPKJC uh, effective core potential on every platinum atom. And we're just comparing uh, serial timings. What you can see is that uh, yeah, you can see the asymptotic scaling. QCAM5 uh, hasn't quite reached its uh, ideal linear um, uh, behavior, and that's uh, simply because the upper bound has not yet reached the ideal um, uh, asymptotic behavior yet, and also the cost of evaluating the upper bound as well moves this from uh, the ideal 1.0 to 1.56. But what you can see is that um, QCAM5 is both orders of magnitude faster than QCAM4.4 and then even faster than uh, Dalton and Games US. So just summarizing some of the um, new ECP capabilities in QCAM5, um, I think the biggest one and most uh, requested feature um, was that the new ECP library in QCAM5 can handle arbitrary basis function angular momentum and ECP projector angular momentum. In the previous uh, ECP code in QCAM, this was not the case. We were limited to F projectors and also limited to, I think for the F projector, uh, max angular momentum on the basis functions of uh, DD. So um, that meant that a lot of uh, more modern uh, ECPs were inaccessible, such as the Stuttgart Cologne ECPs. And it also meant that a lot of uh, heavier elements, say the lanthanides and the actinides, or um, uh, say a platinum or gold atom were inaccessible to uh, QCAM users previously, which is now not the case because our recurrence relation is, can handle arbitrary projector angular momentum and arbitrary basis function. You can do pretty much any ECP and system that you would like. Furthermore, um, when you do these systems, you're gonna get the advantage of the efficient screening or current relations to evaluate the ECP integrals. So um, you're gonna get those calculations done much more quickly. Um, and yeah, the biggest component to that is the efficient screening, which improves the algorithm from the form of cubic scaling to the linear scaling. Uh, also really important, uh, we now have analytical gradients and Hessians for our ECP integrals, um, well, sorry, for, for ECPs. Um, and yeah, that's a really big improvement on what was previously offered by QCAM and other codes um, because only finite difference gradients um, and Hessians were previously uh, 
of it. Um, so now you get more precise, um, well, more accurate gradients and Hessians, but you also get them in significantly less time. And finally, um, because uh, all of the ECP integrals were implemented, the new libqint framework, which has a general um, framework for doing shared memory parallelization uh, using OpenMP, you get parallel computation um, basically for free, which is nice. Um, so just as a little demonstration um, that I cooked up for the webinar, um, let's take a look at uh, the case example of the cisplatin molecule, um, which I'm told is a chemotherapy medicinal drug used to treat a wide range of cancers. Um, it's listed on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. Uh, it's a square planar um, platinum two complex, as you can see here. And uh, one might be interested in how do we accurately model um, cisplatin's chemistry using effective core potentials. So um, I guess this is sort of a slide with a couple of um, tips and uh, yeah, um, showing you how to maybe go about using ECPs in your calculations. So um, biggest thing I would recommend always being careful of is that when you do an ECP calculation, make sure that you use a similar quality in your ECP and all electron basis sets. So that means make sure you're using, um, if you're using uh, yeah, double zeta polarized quality for your um, all electron basis set around your non-ECP atoms, make sure you're using a double zeta polarization basis set for your valence electrons around your ECP atom. I've seen a number of uh, studies um, using DFT, a LAN or TDZ uh, basis set, which is a double zeta basis set for your ECP atom, and then maybe a um, triple zeta quality for your non-ECP atom. That is not a good thing to do because you will start seeing artifact, artifacts um, uh, within your calculation whereby, for instance, electrons will be relatively stabilized in your non-ECP center basis sets purely because they have more mathematical flexibility, not because of the actual underlying chemistry. So um, just, I guess, a, a, a bit of a plug, uh, I personally would recommend um, uh, the CCPVXZPP correlation consistent ECPs and basis sets. So this is something coming out of the, the Stuttgart Cologne um, family of ECPs and they're, I, I would say, pretty much regarded as um, state of the art. Um, what's shown here on the right is the associated um, uh, ECP and I guess I just wanted to show this because um, well, a couple of things for you to see what uh, an ECP looks like if you wanted to uh, grab it from the basis set exchange. Um, so what we have in the first column are the radial powers, including the Jacobian. So two here actually corresponds to an R to the zero factor. And in the first column, you've got your exponents. And in the second column, you've got your contraction coefficients for your ECP radial potential. And here you've got the, um, the basically projector blocks uh, for your ECP. And what I really want to emphasize is that um, this platinum ECP goes up to G projectors, as you can see here. And this is uh, a calculation that would have been previously infeasible in QCAM and is actually currently infeasible in a lot of um, existing uh, quantum chemical codes such as um, uh, games, for instance, and others. Uh, unfortunately, you will need to um, user define both this ECP and the associated basis sets, so you can get those off the basis set exchange, but they will be included as QCAM standards um, soon in an upcoming release. So, um, what have I done here? I've yeah, basically just done an MP2 geometry optimization and frequency calculation using a CCPBZ PP basis set with the associated ECP for the platinum atom here in the center and a CCPBZ basis set for the non-ECP atoms um, around the edge. And um, yeah, you can get useful chemical um, uh, 
quantities out of that, so the platinum chlorine bond distance, for instance, or the platinum chlorine stretch frequency, which is shown in this nice video here, um, using our QMOL, and uh, for instance, the MP2 correlation energy. So these, these basis, uh, these correlation consistent pseudo-potential basis sets are really, really useful if you want to start accurately modeling um, uh, systems with heavier elements. All right, um, so I need to talk about um, uh, ECP reconstruction. So um, you'll remember that at the very beginning I talked that the radial potentials can, sorry, the radial potentials can have radial powers of either r to the negative 2, r to the negative 1, and r to the 0. And in the case that they only include r to the 0 terms, you have this really nice, beautiful, simple expression for the fundamental integral. Um, and that's really nice, but many ECPs unfortunately do have r to the negative 2 and r to the negative 1 factors in their radial potential terms. And so how do we use, um, how can we possibly use our new ECP um, method, which is fast and efficient, um, on these ECPs? Uh, and we do that by reconstructing um, those ECPs with r to the negative 2 and r to the negative 1 terms to only have r to the 0 terms. So you can see on the right here, um, uh, for instance, um, a range of different ECPs de-projector radial potentials for um, the platinum atom. So we've got the Stuttgart relativistic guys, Lennel DZ, which is a very popular ECP, Kren BS, and SBKJC, and um, the Stuttgart relativistic small core um, ECPs. And actually, this is a general comment about the Stuttgart clone family of ECPs generally have. Um, uh, only R to the zero terms, so that's why we particularly like them. Um, whereas ECPs such as SBKJC or LANOCTDZ do have R to the negative two terms. But you can sort of see that all of this variation between the ECPs happens in the core region here, and actually in the valence region, um, the ECPs basically look the same, and that that makes sense because really the, they're all trying to reproduce the same valence behavior. And the short range ECP um, behavior here, which you can see large differences, really doesn't affect the valence region that much. Um, and so this really led to the supposition that, well, maybe this short super um, core behavior isn't that important and we can just reconstruct, say, the level 2 dz um, or SBKJC ECP using only R to the zero terms and not affect the chemistry um, significantly. So the idea here is um, uh, if we just focus in on the uh, SBKJC platinum D radial potential, um, which is this guy here, um, yeah, where the first column is the, the radial powers, second column is the exponents, and third column is the contraction coefficients um, for your radial potential. The idea is we want to uh, get rid of this uh, nasty negative two term. And the way that we do that is um, we replace that one r to the negative two term with a sum of three r to the zero terms. The nonlinear coefficients are fixed according to the simple recipe. So 42.6 is the original exponent here, and you the three um, fitting r to the zero terms simply have exponents of 30.5 times that exponent, 5.4 times, and 1.5 five times, and then we do a, um, we determine the best linear coefficients using that entire block of um, uh, terms in the radial potential. And the result is, you can see the original SBKJC um, radial potential in the blue, and the red is the reconstructed SBKJC ECP. Um, so it might look a bit alarming that you have this big, uh, I guess, difference between the original and reconstructed SBKJC, but I should probably just emphasize the scale at which this is current. So um, on the x-axis we have um, the the radius, uh, but it is in bores, and the sort of differences that we're talking about occur in the range from 0 to 0 0.1 bores, 
which is really the inner 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 core region of your uh, ECP and um, yeah because the difference is so isolated to the core it really does not play a role in um, the chemistry of the ECP so to just show you that um, yeah uh, so the statement is that the reconstructed ECPs reproduce the chemistry of the original ECP very well because the differences are solely isolated to the inner inner, inner core region and um, you can see that if you look at a range of molecular properties so if we take SPKJFC and we look at um, the dissociation energy, the equilibrium bond length, the um, mode of vibration uh, for a range of diatomics um, and the areas are between the original SPKJC ECP and the reconstructed version, you can see that the errors are very, very small. And um, in fact, it's probably good to emphasize that the SPKJC uh, case is actually the worst case because it has such a small, um, a small number of terms, it doesn't give the fit much flexibility to uh, um, perform a better fit. And so for other ECPs such as Lanoctidz, you'll see much, even even smaller errors for um, uh, chemical phenomena. So on average, you'll see when you do this uh, reconstruction, you'll see an error of around 0 0.3 kilojoules per mole in dissociation energies, 0 0.08 picometers in bond lengths, and 0 0.6 wave numbers in vibrational frequencies. Um, and yet, just want to emphasize as well, these errors are on the same order of magnitude as those introduced by numerical integration in most other ECP methods. So most other ECP methods rely on numerical integration and that introduces an error, which is basically equivalent to the reconstruction that we're doing. So just to show you um, the, the practicalities of using um, this reconstruction process in QCAM. Um, if we look at say a platinum oxide diatomic with SPKJC ECP on the platinum atom, um, the new QCAM ECP user interface really wants to ensure that you're aware of the reconstruction process so that we're not uh, pulling, uh, you know, we're not cheating you at all. And so if you submit a, a QCAM job like this, um, the job will crash and you'll get a hopefully very helpful uh, error message as, uh, like this, which says QCAM no longer uses the SPKJC ECP, please request the chemically equivalent fit SPKJC ECP instead, um, which is simply the reconstructed equivalent of the original SPKJC ECP. And so um, if you just then replace the ECP with fit SPKJC, this job will run fine. Um, but yeah, we really wanted to ensure that the user is aware that um, there is um, some difference in the ECP that they're using. Um, another example is if you wanted to user define an ECP which had R to the negative two or R to the negative one um, terms here, as is the case for, I think this is the SBKJC ECP for the lithium atom, um, then you will get the following error. So QCAM no longer supports ECPs with n equals zero or one terms. Um, so that's including the Jacobian again. Um, please use the REM ECP fit equal true to obtain a chemically equivalent fit of the requested ECP. So if we replace this input um, like this, where we've now introduced this REM ECP fit equal true, then basically QCAM will at runtime perform a reconstruction of your user-defined ECP, um, which will be um, chemically equivalent. Um, yes, and I think that is uh, all I have to say about ECPs at the moment in QCAM 5 and onwards. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. That was an extremely thorough and interesting talk. It's a, it's a really important foundational feature of QCAM, and you've done you've clearly done some great work with it. I know we've got time for a few questions. I was curious if the gradient and Hessian performance for the uh, projected integrals that on the, the same uh, order of magnitude as a single point performance? Um, there'll be 
uh, that's a very good question. Um, uh, they'll be slightly uh, slower. So basically, the gradients and the Hessians are simply computed by um, uh, computing the um, uh, angular momentum uh, bumped up and bumped down uh, integrals, if that makes sense. So if you want a, a, a um, if you want a first derivative of a dd um, projected integral, then you can compute that by combining uh, a, if I remember this correctly, an FD and a PD integral. If you're doing Hessians, you can do that by combining a GD and a SD. And so the the gradients and the Hessians will be slightly more expensive because you're computing um, integrals of higher angular momentum basis uh, function, no, higher basis function angular momentum, but um, fairly comparable. Thank you, that's helpful. I've got a few questions now from the audience. Let's see. Um, off the top of your head, do you have any uh, recommended references for ECPs that you found useful? Um, if you think of some later, we could probably send those out in some way. Yeah, I th um, there's a really, sorry, I should have probably put it as a reference in the, the talk. There's a really great review by Dolg. Um, I think it's in ChemRev, um, which just, uh, goes through the foundation of ECPs, but I think in particularly, uh, particularly important for users, um, it goes through some benchmarks of different ECPs, um, comparing amongst ECPs, but then also importantly against uh, full relativistic um, calculations. Um, so yeah, uh, look for the review by Dog. Great, thank you. Um, I think this was mentioned. Uh, there's also a question here about the uh, DEF2 XBVP basis set. Uh, would you recommend this? Yeah, I think um, uh, that's a great basis set to use. I think, um, yeah, again, keeping with um, my emphasis on it's really important that you treat the valence, that you treat the ECP basis set to a similar quality as your non ECP basis set. The DEF2 series of ECPs and basis sets are really good for that. Um, and yeah, I think they are now part of the QCAM standard ECP and basis sets. And uh, once again, um, a lot of the DEF2 ECPs for actinides and lanthanides, which were previously inaccessible using the old QCAM ECP library, are now accessible. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, it's a great choice. Great. Sounds good. Um, here's, here's an interesting question. Um, could you, or do you have any comments on the difference between uh, these, these ECPs that were discussed here uh, and other pseudopotentials used for periodic calculations, specifically uh, non-local pseudopotentials? Oh, <laughs> um, that's a very good question. Um, Honestly, uh, no, unfortunately, I, I don't have too much comment. Um, uh, as the user is probably aware, or as uh, sorry, the questionnaire is um, questionnaire is probably aware. QChem is uh, a, a non-periodic code, um, and so that that has been um, yeah, basically the the sandpit that I've been playing in. Um, yeah, no, sorry, I, I won't be able to um, comment on that. That, that, that's fine, sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, I think we've got time for one more here. Um, you, you showed pretty convincingly that the, the FIT ECPs um, are, are equivalent to the originals. Uh, can you give a uh, reference for, for maybe some literature comparisons that, that, that uh, examine this in more depth? Yeah, um, absolutely. So uh, if I just go to um, yeah, we, yeah, so the, the paper, um, we've published a paper on this ECP method, which is just um, the reference shown here, um, which is just the paper shown here at the bottom. Um, and yeah, that goes into much more depth about uh, the um, errors introduced by this uh, reconstruction process. Um, so yeah, I, will, I would point you in the direction of this paper. Great, thank you. I think. Uh, just to I'll answer this one quickly, these are all uh, available in QCAM 5 and later? Yes, yeah. Um, 
uh, yeah, in QCAM 5.0, the new ECP method was introduced with analytical gradients. The Hessians um, weren't quite linked up yet, so we're still doing, um, I think, finite difference Hessians, but um, as of 5.1, uh, everything's analytical, so um, the ECP intervals, gradients, Hessians, um, yeah, it's all, all linked up. So it's available now. Sounds good. All right, thanks again, Simon. That was a really uh, interesting talk. I'm going to bring it to a close here. Um, I'd like to thank Simon again for, for speaking, agreeing to put this together, and I'd like to thank all our attendees for watching and participating. Uh, you can find this webinar in a few days and all of the other ones on our website, uh, qchem.com. And there's a workshop and webinars link here. This is uh, the list, and these will link right to YouTube. I also encourage new users to check out the QCAM website. We have a variety of instructional materials uh, that can be used to, to learn some of the basics or even for uh, teaching purposes. Uh, thanks again, Simon and everyone. Uh, this concludes our webinar. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes our webinar. We would like to thank Simon McKenzie for his excellent presentation, as well as Dr. Adrian Morrison for organizing, running, and moderating this webinar. We also invite you to visit us on Facebook. Thank you for your participation, and see you at the next webinar.